All right, guys, here we go with our first uh, recorded lecture. Um, hopefully, try not to make these too long. Um, as I mentioned in the email, I'm going to have an associated discussion post uh, for you guys to just kind of respond to the lecture, just kind of make sure everyone's keeping up and, and kind of uh, following along. Um, so anyway, here we go. Um, so thus far, we've been focused really on service fire spread. Um, and as I've mentioned a few times, you know, we're going to start talking about uh, how we think about modeling crown fires. Um, particularly, this is an important, right, because these are the fires that are going to uh, spread really fast and kind of do the most uh, damage and pose the largest risks for, um, you know, humans and infrastructure and, and whatnot. So, so there's a lot of concern in, in predicting when these are going to occur. Um, you know, whether our treatments are effective in reducing uh, their initiation, particularly, as we're going to discuss today, um, and then obviously how they're going to spread, which we'll, we'll talk about in future lectures. Um, so anyway, here we go. We're going to talk about uh, modeling crown fire initiation. Um, right, so crown fire initiation, uh, often called tree torching, um, when we're thinking about individual or groups of trees, um, but crown fire initiation is when a surface fire is able to ignite the crowns and, and spread into the crown of the tree. Um, for this to occur, we need enough energy, right, to come off of that surface fire to heat our crown fuels and ignite them. Um, and, and this energy is coming in the form of both radiation and convection. Um, this process can't really occur without uh, convection, but, but radiation plays a really important role um, in preheating and, and uh, the, the propagation. Um, so we need both those modes. Um, so here's a little image I, I made just showing the kind of energy balance here, right? We've got radiative and convective heat coming from our fire, um, but simultaneously, right, that tree is going to be cooled by um, the, the cool air, right, that the fire is pulling in. Um, there's also just some radiative cooling, right? Any object that's hotter than the ambient is going to release and lose energy radiatively um, while it's being heated simultaneously, so that's part of the energy balance. Um, and then there might also be some cooling from the, the ambient wind that's that's pushing the fire, um, maybe up higher in the crown, um, but um, that, that's part of the balance as, as well. Um, so what we need to do is is predict that that heat transfer, right? And so the the really the most popular um, formula or, or, or model used is is this one developed by Van Wagner back in 1977. Um, so I'm going to have a link to that paper up on Canvas if you want to check it out. But in there, he talks about both predicting the ignition and initiation of crown fire, um, and then also how they, they spread. Um, so in this paper, he, he highlights that, that really our, our, our main problem here in, in crown fire prediction is about this interaction of two fuel layers, right? Our surface fuel layer and our, our crown fuel layer. Um, and, and really the primary challenge here is uh, predicting the transition right from our surface layer up into the crowns. Um, so in his model, he he describes these two fuel complexes as as basically separate things. Um, right, our canopy fuels have are, are described with uh, bulk density, uh, the the fuel moisture, right, so the moisture content in the needles, um, and then as well as canopy base height or um, this idea that there's sort of a distinct open space in the the canopy between the surface and where our, our crown or, or canopy fuels um, start. Uh, for the surface fire, uh, he actually does not do any modeling or prediction about surface fire. Um, basically, that's just inputted into the model in the form of fire line intensity. Um, so we can either measure that in the field, um, we could guess what we think it might be, or we could use another model like Roth or Mel's spread model to, uh, to predict our, our potential fire line in intensity for whatever case. Um, so here's just a visual, right? So we've got uh, these canopy fuels characterized uh, in the following ways. Um, and then our, our surface fire component is, is either going to be modeled or, or measured in the field. Um, and we just have that one input really coming from or, or describing the surface fire, uh, right? So you'll notice we're just using intensity. So um, rate of spread infects in affects intensity, but it doesn't actually go into this model. Um, all we care about is, is what the, the intensity is at the end of the day. Um, and we'll see that that just has to do with the way he he set this model up. Um, so as I said, you know, we go out and measure it in the field, um, right? Measure our fuel consumption and the rate of spread. 
and we can we can estimate an intensity or we could just we could just go ahead and model it um, so the way this works is, is basically there's this theory uh, or you know it's, it's all surrounded around this theory that ignition is uh, dependent on reaching some minimum temperature at the base of the crown right we need to get up our fuels up to this temperature in order for them to ignite um, right so it's just a simple question is the temperature at the crown base height um, greater than x being our, our ignition temperature right so if it is hot enough it will ignite and if not then crown ignition will not um, occur so this is actually pretty similar uh, to something we've already talked about right which is predicting crown damage or, or crown scorch right we, we were basically asking you know what height in the crown would reach 60 C our sort of cutoff for needle death um, so rather than needle death now we're just concerned at the height at which um, ignition could occur um, and then if our crown base height is lower than that uh, we would expect uh, crown ignition or, or crown fire transition to to uh, be possible um, so similar to our, our discussion of crown scorch right we saw there are these different models to predict the change in temperature above a uh, line fire um, in this case van wagner uh, worked off of a, a, a correlation between intensity and temperature change that was presented uh, by, by this researcher Thomas in 1963. Um, right, we just have our image down here showing how uh, temperature changes as you go up above the fire line, right? So, so the temperature, I don't know if you can see my cursor, we'll, we'll have to test that out, probably not. Um, you can see how the temperature decreases, right, as we go up in, in Z or, or up in height. So yeah, so Van Wagner, um, use this Thomas equation. So here it is. Uh, we've got the change in temperature is equal to the fire line intensity uh, raised to the two thirds divided by uh, Z being our, our, our height of interest. Um, right. So we have fire line intensity. We have the, the height we're interested in. And then we've got change in T, um, which is really about the change in the gas temperature. Right. So what, what's the temperature of the gas at that particular height? Um, so Wagner took this equation. Um, and we need to, to do some modifications, right? So, so that equation is predicting gas temperature, um, but we really want to, to uh, predict the temperature rise of the actual needles, right? We need to figure out, are these needles gonna get hot enough to ignite? Um, so in addition to that concept of gas temperature above a fire, we also need to think about our uh, temperature required for ignition, right? We've seen this before. Um, if we wanna heat a fuel particle up to ignition temperature, uh, we need to do two things, right? We need to uh, heat the actual dry component up of the fuel up to the ignition temperature. Um, and then we also need some amount of energy to evaporate um, and, and drive the, the moisture in the fuel particle off of um, the particle. So I got a, a note here, right? This is from lecture five, um, our, our, our ignition energy equation, right? So, so dry uh, heat, heat for the dry mass, heat for the wet mass. Uh, we, we add those things together and, and we see how much energy we need to ignite um, that particular uh, fuel particle. Um, all right, so what did Van Wagner do? The first thing he wants to do is, is rearrange this equation um, to get intensity on its own. Um, right, so basically uh, we, we swap these terms around and now we have uh, intensity equals the change in temperature times height. Uh, raised to the uh, one half or, or three over two. Um, and so this, this will basically allow us to predict um, or, or start letting us to think about how we might predict a, a critical intensity where ignition would occur. Um, so we've got this change in temperature, but as we said, that's the change in temperature of the gas. Um, but we, we really need to figure out how much we're heating the needles at, at some given height above the fire line. Um, so there's a couple aspects to that, right? So we need to account for this, this heat needed for ignition, um, but we also need some variable to account for, you know, the, the rate of, of heat transfer, right? How, how fast is that temperature going to, or, or how fast is that heat going to transfer to our needle? And then how fast is the temperature of the needle going to rise? Um, you know, we could take a physical approach to this and, and, and actually try and do the, uh, the heat transfer equations out. Um, However, uh, Van Wagner is going to take a little bit more of an empirical approach for, for good reasons, right? We, we, can't, uh, we can't do all that physics and all that math every time we want to make this prediction. 
Um, and, and so Van Wagner wanted to, to make a simpler approach. Um, so first thing he did is he's uh, coming up with a generic heat of ignition for a pine needle. Um, and basically just using the standard formula here, which is in uh, kilojoules per kilogram, um, right? So that 460, so H equals 460, uh, 460 being the, the number of kilojoules required to raise um, one kilogram of dry needles or, or dry wood up to the ignition temperature. Um, and then 26 times M, this is going to account for the uh, energy required to push off the water, um, where, where M is the percent fuel moisture um, actually as a percentage, right? So if it's 100%, our M would be equal to 100. Uh, or if it's 90%, our M would be 90, not you know 0.9. Uh, we want to use the whole percentage um, in this equation. Um, okay, so that's that's how much heat we need. Um, but then we also are going to need another variable here to account for uh, both heat transfer and the, the rate of temperature rise required to cause ignition. Um, and what Van Wagner is going to do here is he's going to just introduce this constant C, um, which he says or, or defines as uh, the quantity C is best regarded as an empirical constant of complex dimensions, right? So there's all this heat transfer and temperature rise all built into this one number. Um, and then we're going to need to find its value from observation. Um, so when we, we stick the H and the C into that rearranged Thomas formula, uh, we end up with Van Wagner's model for uh, the initiation of crowning. All right, so I0, that's going to be the critical intensity needed for ignition uh, based on our, our selected uh, variables. Um, so C is a constant, um, Z is our canopy base height, and H is the heat of ignition. So if we plug in Z, H, and C, uh, and, and, and multiply that out and then raise it by the three halves, uh, it will tell us our critical intensity, right? So our critical intensity being um, the fire line intensity required to uh, ignite a tree or, or really a stand with, with that characteristic canopy base height. Um, all right. So for, for intensity, right, we're, we're still going to use this Byram equation or, or Van Wagner rather use this Byram equation that we've seen many times now, right? So heat of combustion times the fuel consumption times the rate of spread. Um, as we've also seen, uh, fire line intensity can be substituted with flame length and vice versa, um, but there are some issues with that. And uh, intensity is really a sort of a more basic fire behavior parameter. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, we're gonna, we're gonna use intensity, Van Wagner used intensity. It's um, yeah, just the, the better variable to use here. Um, and as we're gonna see, uh, and the way behave works is by linking this using the reaction intensity predicted from Rother Mel. Um, and there may be a, a couple of assumptions in there, or a couple of issues with that that are discussed further by uh, Alexander and Cruz, which is another paper I'm going to throw up on Canvas for you to, to, to check out if, if you're interested in some more information on that. Um, so anyway, we're, we're going to use Byram's fire line intensity, or we're going to assume our critical intensity is the same as uh, our Byram fire line intensity. Um, okay, so anyway, we, we know how to calculate I, right? We could either predict it in our model or, or we could calculate it from field measurements. Uh, we know how to calculate H as long as we have a, a needle moisture. Um, so now we have to figure out what is this constant C? Um, what are we gonna stick in there? So uh, so as we saw on the Van Wagner quote, right? He, he thinks that this complex, uh, value needs to be found through field observation, right? Uh, so as we've seen, experimentation has played a really big role in the development of these models. Um, so we're going to need to do some field experiments, and uh, that's exactly what Van Wagner did uh, actually back in the mid to late 60s. Um, so estimating C from some field experiments, so what they did, they found all of these um, these pine plantations, uh, actually a couple of spruce plantations as well, uh, up in Canada, and they went out and you know took all these these standard measurements, right? Our, our tree densities, basal area, tree heights. They they've got the crown base height and then our foliage bulk densities. Um, so here's the stands that they they did these test fires on. 
Um, basically, they broke these stands up into, I think, about one hectare blocks um, where they, they basically put big dozer lines around each block to be able to contain uh, the fire and, and just do a bunch of independent tests, um, basically to try and estimate um, at what intensity the crown fire or the surface fire would transition into the crowns um, and then use this to, to calculate our, our C. Um, so here's just a couple of photos. This is pretty close to what Van Wagner's experiments looked like, um, but these photos are actually from a more recent uh, international crown fire modeling experiment. Um, I just picked them because you can actually you can actually see the fire pretty well here. Um, right, so in the top left, we've got a nice, big, fully developed uh, crown fire. Right, so that's well past transition and in, into active crown fire spread. Um, and you can kind of see how they, they cut out these big uh, these big blocks out of the forest to do these experiments. Um, so pretty cool stuff. I'm, I'm sure that those guys had a bunch of fun, um, but also a bunch of uh, you know good and important science happening as well. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of what they looked like. Um, here's some pictures from Van Wagner's paper. Um, so you know they had plenty of good cameras in '77, but I think that somewhere along the lines this thing was photocopied one too many times. Um, so anyway, these are, the, these are the best pictures I could find of, of the actual experiments Van Wagner did. Um, but there you go. So we got, we got these pine plantations, we, we started line fires, and then we, he took a bunch of measurements as the fires progressed to sort of estimate, um, estimate at what point the transition occurred. Um, so here's his table. Um, with sort of the, the average summary of, of the, the fire behavior. Um, in, including some, some, these are some calculations in here that we're going to talk about later, like the critical spread rate. Um, but he does have the actual spread rate of the fire R, so that's how fast they were moving in reality, uh, at least on average. Um, and then for his initiation, um, what he did is he basically found the experiment that um, was just on the edge, like just as that transition was happening, they took some measurements on the rate of spread and the amount of fuel consumption, um, which, which they basically estimated by, by measuring the fuels before the fire and measuring the fuels after the fire, um, and assuming that difference there was the, the fuel consumed. Um, but so they used that to, to figure out the intensity at the moment when the transition from surface to crown occurred. Um, he ended up picking this one fire from the Jack Plan Pine Plantation uh, labeled SC, um, basically at the time of initiation, uh, he, he had a, an average crown base height of six meters, the foliar moisture content, that's what that FMC is of 100%, and the, the estimated or uh, measured, uh, kind of roughly measured surface fire intensity was around 2,500 kilowatts per meter. Um, and so given these numbers, that comes out to a, a, a C of 0 0.010. Um, Right, so, so this constant was developed based on that one experiment, uh, which is really a, a limitation, you know, an empirical limitation of the model that um, there wasn't really an ability to, to do a lot of replication here. He just kind of went with um, sort of the best experiment that he had uh, to work with. Um, I just thought I would quickly show you how that math works to, to calculate C. Um, right, so we've got our equation of our critical in energy or sorry, our, our critical intensity equaling C times Z times H raised to the three halves. Um, we know our intensity uh, from the field was 2,500. Our Z was estimated at six meters. Um, and then we can calculate H using 100% fuel moisture. Um, so down here, you can see I, I plug in all of our knowns. Uh, we do out the math. We, we basically solve for C there um, and, and we work our way down and you'll, I just kind of wanted to show you how that worked out and that C comes out to just about 0 0.01. Um, remembering that, that there aren't really uh, units on C, it's just a constant um, that's, that's really a, kind of a complex number encompassing both the heat transfer and the, uh, the energy change of the, the pine needles. And it actually has, has a built-in assumption that ignition occurs at 300 degrees C. Um, so kind of all of those things are, are wrapped up into this one number.
Um, so anyway, now we can stick C into the equation and we basically have our full Van Wagner model for crown fire uh, transition. Right, so, so basically as long as we know the, the canopy base height and our moisture content, uh, we can make a prediction about the surface fire intensity required to ignite those crowns. Um, so, kind of as I went through, I, I mentioned a number of these. Um, there, there are kind of a lot of assumptions in here, and um, I will say that um, you know we talk about assumptions a lot in modeling because it's it's really important to know what what you're assuming. Um, but it's also important for me to just say that uh, despite all of these assumptions, you know the, these equations and these models have proved to be uh, extremely helpful for for both firefighting and you know things like fire planning and fuel treatments and, and whatnot. Um, you know, it's certainly don't want to give the impression that this is a useless model or it doesn't work because you know when used appropriately, it, it's actually very useful. Um, we just need to be aware of these these different assumptions that are kind of baked into the math. Um, right, so we're, for one, we're assuming that the air temperature, the, the ambient air temperature is not important, right? The, whether it's 60 degrees out or, or 90 degrees out uh, Fahrenheit, it, um, it shouldn't change the ignition energy all that significantly. Um, we've seen this, right, when we're, we're heating up a, a fuel particle. Um, it's really about the moisture of the fuel is, is far more important than the initial temperature of the actual fuel particle, um, right? And that's just due to the latent heat of vaporization, um, right? It takes, takes a lot of energy to vaporize that water compared to just heating up the, the dry fuel. Um, we are also gonna assume that the vertical spread red is independent of the bulk density of the crowns. Uh, basically that means that as soon as we get an ignition in the lower crown, uh, we're kind of making the assumption that there's plenty of fuel in there for that ignition to propagate vertically through the tree. Uh, this is a, a pretty decent assumption unless you've got some really, you know, funky crown shapes or really sparse trees or something like that. Um, we are describing the, the entire spatial complexity of crown base height using a single number, right? So, so Van Wagner assumed the, the mean crown base height for the stand, um, but, uh, you know, stands are complex, right? Some, some trees might have a little bit of a lower crown base. Some pockets of the stand might have a lower or a higher crown base height. Um, and, and we're kind of assuming we can characterize that variability with, with just a mean, um, right? So, so in complex stands where we've got a big variety of tree sizes, we might want to think a little more carefully about what number we pick, right, for that crown base height. Um, it's also assuming that these stands are horizontally homogeneous. That is, he did these, or he did these experiments in a plantation or several plantations Right, so we've got really evenly spaced and, in fact, rather dense trees. Um, and then this, this equation gets used to stands that, that look quite different. Um, uh, he's also making this assumption about fire line intensity, right, that we can characterize it using a single number that, that kind of characterizes its, uh, its value across space and time. Um, similar to Roth and Mel, right, this homogeneous steady state assumption. Um, which we know to not necessarily be true, but to be uh, useful. Um, and then once again, C, right, one equation, or sorry, sorry one experiment um, in, in that dense jack pine um, plantation. And then finally, uh, these numbers were based on an ignition temperature of 300 C, uh, which I think is a decent number. And, um, but, you know, just, just to be aware that that, that is the um, sort of assumed ignition temperature. Um, so anyway, that's that's the way this works. Um, there's been some some efforts to kind of look at uh, and do some evaluations of Van Wagner, um, particularly how Van Wagner is then linked to other models, which which we're going to talk about moving forward. Um, but first, I just just got a chart, some charts here showing how um, the initiation, right? So the I zero varies with both crown base height, obviously, as as you have taller crowns, uh, you need more energy to ignite them and then also the moisture content of the fuel. Um, and then plot B here is just showing that if we use Byram's flame length model, we could just use flame length instead. Um, and this is also kind of to highlight that um, the flame length is gonna be uh, a little bit lower than the actual crown base height. Um, so the flames don't necessarily need to be exactly touching the crowns or at least predicted to be exactly touching the crowns. Um, they're gonna be a little bit 
beneath the uh, the crowns when ignition occurs, um, and that that gap between flame length and the actual uh, crown base height gets larger as your trees get bigger. Um, right, and that's just there's there's kind of a lot of a lot of reasons we could unpack that, but um, but anyway, you know, just just to to be aware, right? We don't need complete flame contact to get this initiation or or, or this ignition started. So how's this thing used? Well, we're going to use it in Behave because uh, Behave uses it as a linkage between the, the Rother Mel surface fire equation and um, ultimately we'll see the Rother Mel crown fire spread equation. We haven't gotten there yet, but um, this Van Wagner equation is used as the link in Behave, um, but it's also the, the link in Nexus, FFE, um, Flame Map and, and, and Farsa use it to different extents um, and you know lots of other models. Um, where it's, it's based on using Byram's fire line intensity, right, to make this prediction, um, but it doesn't predict intensity itself, right? So, so once again, we need to link this with a surface fire model uh, that's gonna give us our, our estimate of, of intensity. Um, all right, so typically, uh, you know, in, in all those models I just listed, we're gonna use the Rother Mel 72 surface fire model to link uh, intensity to the critical intensity predicted by, by Van Wagner, um, and ultimately to determine whether or not this, this ignition will occur. Um, so it basically just looks like this, right? So first we predict our, uh, our reaction intensity from Roth or Mel. We compare that to the predicted um, intensity required, right? And if the intensity is greater, well, there you go. We've got crown fire ignition. Uh, but if the surface fire intensity is not high enough, well, then no crown um, ignition is going to occur. Um, so it's really that simple. That's that's basically the way the linkage works, um, relying on Rothermel's surface fire equation, um, right? So so the big thing that jumps out here is the fact that um, we are assuming that that we can just substitute in Rothermel's intensity for Van Wagner's intensity, um, and you know in theory they should be the same, but um, you know, they, they aren't necessarily, and, and there's been some work that suggests perhaps using this linkage um, results in a, a pretty big uh, underestimation. Um, so, uh, so Cruz did this analysis basically showing that, um, you know, so, so the critical flame wind speed there on the bottom, so as you increase wind speed, we get higher intensities. Um, and basically, using using the linkage that Behave does, he's suggesting that uh, we would need a much higher wind speed to predict uh, to predict ignition than if we were using truly using Byram's um, intensity calculation, because um, there are some differences right between the way that Rothermel and Byram defined intensity, and, and we we've talked about that previously. Um, so potential issue, and, and as I've said, this, this model has been very useful for, for us here in the US, and um, there, there are obviously maybe, you know, maybe some issues and some things to think about, but um, despite this potential for underreaction or underestimation, um, it has, uh, it's, it's presumed satisfactory, satisfactorily. Uh, just, just once again, good to be um, aware of these issues. Um, so here's just a summary kind of from that Cruz and Alexander paper, um, um, and actually probably a couple other things in here, but potential issues used with the linkages. Um, so, so we've talked about some of this, but you know, in Roth or Mel, intensity is calculated with from an estimation of the residence time, um, but that residence time um, may actually underpredict compared to actual residence times, um, or sorry. It, it over predicts re resulting in an under prediction of intensity, right? So it, it predicts re residence times that are too long, uh, which would give you a lower intensity, right? When we increase our residence time, that means the energy is getting released over a longer period, um, and therefore our, our fire line intensity goes down. Um, so maybe some issues with Roth and Mel's residence time. Uh, another thing is that when Van Wagner calculated intensity, he measured service fuel load before the fire and service fuel load after the fire, um, right? But that means that we're also lumping in combustion that occurred after the fire front, right? So all that flaming, or sorry, all that glowing and smoldering combustion 
um, is getting lumped into his intensity, even though uh, intensity is typically defined on just the flaming front, right? Um, so it's kind of hard to discriminate those two forms of combustion in the field. Um, and so his method may have, may have basically uh, over predicted the intensity during his, uh, his actual experiments. Um, once again, this idea that, that, that heterogeneity in the real world is going to increase some of the uncertainty, um, right? So, so basically, fire line intensity might vary somewhere within that stand. So there might be a little bit of a patch of higher intensity that causes the ignition or the initiation. Um, right, so so we only really need to reach that initiation point or ignition point in, in one portion of the fire to, to start kicking off our crown fire um, rather than kind of assuming a mean. Um, but anyway, you know, just, just some things to think about, and, and I'm going to put that Alexander and Cruz paper up on, on Canvas for all of you. Um, all right, so that is our talk about uh, modeling the ignition or the initiation of crown fire. Uh, using the Van Wagner approach. Um, so yeah, I'd appreciate it if you could all pop over to a, uh, the discussion post and, and kind of give me some, some, some thoughts about, um, about this process and this theory. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. Talk to you later.